Well, hey there, hey there, good morning team. Let's turn that volume up. I don't know if it makes any difference on my end or not, but <laughs> hey, it's a good day to be alive. The other option would not be good, right? So I guess it's a good day regardless if you wake up, no matter how you feel, <laughs> right? I woke up, it's a great day, right? A lot of people didn't, and they'd love to have another day, wouldn't they? So we're gonna get into some really super important stuff, and uh, we're gonna be breaking this up into a lot of different videos based on intermolecular forces. Now, I talk about this a lot. Uh, uh, you know, introductory, you should have covered that. High school should have covered that. Um, we don't really, at least in my class, first semester of general, chem general chemistry, we don't really cover intermolecular forces specifically. We talk about them, but we really only cover, you know, molecular, how to determine molecular polarity, you know, looking at Vesper structures and three-dimensional symmetry, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't get into the impact of, well, whether if a molecule is polar versus nonpolar, what's the effect of that? That's what we're going to get into. So really, really important to understand IM or intermolecular forces, which are those forces of attractions between the molecules, different species, right? So what we looked at real heavy last semester is if we had a molecule, we look at the intramolecular forces, right? The bonds, covalent bonds, ionic bonds, those kinds of things. Whether they're polar covalent, nonpolar covalent, didn't matter. But we focused on the, these forces between the atoms uh, within a molecule, right? Intra, right? So like when I was in college, I do, I did intercollegiate athletics and intramural sports. So like for track, right? I was good enough in track to run against other colleges. So I go run against UW or something like that. And woo, hey, great. But I'm a little height challenged. I like volleyball. Wasn't good enough to go against other colleges, so we would form these teams within the college, intra, right? Intra versus inter. Intra means within, inter between. So we'd have intramural athletics, and I'd be on an intramural volleyball team, <laughs> right? I'm like, oh, I can't even jump over the, the, the net, <laughs> but it's fine, right? So we're going to be focusing on the forces between. So if I've got a molecule, now whether it's exactly the same molecule or a different one doesn't matter. But when they're approaching each other, what are the forces of interaction between them? Intermolecular forces. And those are critical because without those, how could anything ever exist in the liquid or solid phase, right? If there were no forces between them, there would be nothing, everything would be gas phase, right? There'd be no condensed phases, solids and liquids. So this, we're gonna be looking at this tied into the liquid and solid phases, right? And liquid properties, the effects on those kinds of things. So important, right? And of course, this is very, we're gonna look at the factors that determine the strength of those intermolecular forces, but there's so many things that they impact, and we're gonna talk about a lot of these, right? And I ran out of room on my board, but just for example, what's the, if I have some substance, what's its melting point? What's its boiling point, right? Well, those are impacted by the forces of attraction between them, right? The, if, they're, if there's very strong intermolecular forces, it's harder to pry them apart. It would require more energy, which means higher melting points and higher boiling points. Higher melting points for solids, higher boiling points for liquids. Makes sense, right? So we're interested in how strong are these forces. Now, in my class, we're not going to be calculating specific melting points. Uh, boiling points we'll be able to do later in a little bit. But more I'm looking at, qualitatively, if I have two, say, two different species, which one of them would have the higher melting point, which would have the higher boiling point? That's what I'm after. We'll be able to determine that. Or if I give you three or four different species, you could rank them from lowest to highest. And we're gonna, that's going to be the focus of a lot of these videos. So now, of course, if those intermolecular forces determine melting and boiling points, that would determine the phase of that species at any particular temperature. And we're usually interested in room temperature. What's the phase at room temperature, especially for like elements, right? Is it a liquid, you know, like mercury or bromine or something, or is it a solid or a gas, right? Well, we'll be able to do some estimates with that as well. I could give you two species and say, which is more likely to be a gas at room temperature? It'd be the one with the weaker intermolecular forces. If, if it has strong intermolecular forces, the thermal energy at room temperature would not be enough to break those apart, because that's all melting boiling is. You've got these intermolecular forces, and if the thermal energy from the surrounding temperature is enough, right, higher temperature, right, higher motion, and ooh, if it's enough to break those intermolecular forces, then you can melt and boil species, right, and change its phase at room temperature. That's the main thing we're looking at. Well, 
tied in with that would be the energetics of those. Molar heats of vaporization, molar heats of sublimation. How much energy does it take to separate one mole of species in the liquid phase and create uh, the, uh, the gas phase, right? Molar heat of vaporization. Those are determined by these intermolecular forces. It makes total sense. So regardless of what the phase change is, one thing we'll look at is solubility in the later chapters, right? So based on intermolecular forces, that's going to have an impact on whether these, if they're acting as solid, if we put this in water or in methanol or in ammonia or in, you know, benzene or something, will, will that dissolve? Will those... Right, right, right. Are these molecules more attracted to the solvent or to themselves? Those kinds of things, right? And et cetera, et cetera. I could go on and on. Pretty important stuff. So what I want to, I'm not going to look at the specific types of intermolecular forces in this video. I'm going to do separate videos for each different kind or lump them together in similarity, similar types of intermolecular forces. But what I want to do is look at what impacts intermolecular force strength, right? What are the factors we have to think about? And then I'll give you some terminology. So when we're talking about specific types of intermolecular forces, you know, if I throw you a word polarizability or induction or something, you're like, oh, what does that mean? Well, at least we'll have that under our belt, okay? So let's get ready. Let's look at the what impacts the strength of intermolecular forces. All right, let's take a look at some of the, I'm gonna look at four main factors that really determine the strength of these intermolecular forces because that's what we're after, right? Hey, here's a species. How strong are those intermolecular forces? Okay, we may not be able to, you know, do what a computer does, right, and give you an actual number, all right, to do that, but we can compare two, two different species and go which is stronger, which is not. So I'm gonna pause this and shift this over a second. I smashed into it when I was writing, hold on. <laughs> They're a little better. I don't want my ugly mug. When I start, first started doing videos, I'm like, blah, blah, blah. now I'm like pushing a little further and further over so you can see. You're like, Just get out of, get your head out of the way. I need to pause this and write this down. <laughs> Sorry, you're going to see my ugly mug so much. But, hey, whatever. It's like you're in the front row of my lecture class or something. So four main factors that we're going to be studying uh, to, to impact these intermolecular forces strengths. All right, so first one, polarity. That's, I hammered you last semester with polarity. Here's a molecule. Is it polar or nonpolar? So review that if you need to. Review drawing Lewis structures, Vesper structures, bond polarities, doing the delta En difference, and then looking at that as a whole and going, does this molecule have an even distribution of electric charge, which would make it nonpolar, or an uneven or asymmetric distribution of electric charge, which would make it polar, which it would have a molecular dipole moment. Those little arrows we draw, it's like, which, oh, boom, right, like shish kebab it. Uh, I've got a molecular dipole moment with more, uh, more electrons on this side and less on this side. It's a distorted electron cloud, right? Or an asymmetric electron charge distribution. Well, would it make sense that the more polar it is, where it gets a partial negative and partial positive on one side, well, those have varying strengths, so the more polar it is, the more asymmetric that cloud electron cloud distribution, the more polar it is, the stronger the attraction would be between them, right? And it gets polar all the way to ionic, right, which is like super polar, right? So those, if you, you get this, this massive asymmetric cloud distribution to the point where electrons are transferred and you got a cation anion, that's really strong attraction, right? So that's a key first thing I always look for when it, when somebody says, that, you know, hey, what are the intermolecular forces or how strong are they? I go, is this a polar molecule or not, right? Well, next one we're going to look at is the size. Some people like to put mass on there. They're kind of interchangeable, right? But how big is the electron cloud? How many electrons are there? We're going to find out that that has a very significant effect on molecules or any species, really, atoms, molecules, and how they interact when they come in. Because if I bring these closer together, this electron cloud, which could be symmetric or asymmetric, this has an electron cloud, which could be symmetric or asymmetric, well, when they come closer to each other, can they distort each other's clouds, electron clouds or electron charge distributions, and create something that's more polar than you would think it would be? Oh, anyway, but we're going to look at different types of intermolecular forces. Oh, I lost my hydrogen. Different types of intermolecular forces, that being one of them. But all molecules have electrons, right? All species do. So as they approach, those electron clouds interact with each other, and that we're looking at a term called polarizability, right? So if this molecule has an electron cloud or electron charge distribution, how easily is that 
to distort, right? So maybe it's symmetric nonpolar to start with, but if I bring another molecule closer, can this electron cloud distort that electron cloud and make it asymmetric, right? Which would create dipoles that weren't there before. We're gonna look heavily into that, but how polarizable is it? The more polarizable a species is, the stronger its intermolecular forces are going to be, right? And so that polarizability is the tendency for that electron cloud distribution or, or charge distribution to be distorted, okay, and become more asymmetric. Well, that make, gives it stronger intermolecular forces. <clears throat> so size is going to be a big one. So more, the more electrons that it has, it tends to have stronger intermolecular forces. And we can relate that to mass as well, like atomic mass or molecular mass. Not enough room, so let's do the other two on the next board. All right, ready for the last two? And then after this, I think we've got our, our data bank of ideas down. So when we start looking at the specific types of intermolecular forces, you'll go, oh, that's why that one's stronger than that one, yada, yada, yada. And then when we look at the impact of intermolecular forces on properties of liquids and solids, like you know molar heats of vaporization or whatnot, you'll go, oh, that makes sense why that would be higher in this case or lower in this case and more important here, less important there. All right, just getting the, the stuff out of the way. So we looked at, you know, is the molecule polar or nonpolar? How big is it, right? Those are the things I look at when I'm doing this. And then distance is one that, you know, you don't think about as much, but intermolecular forces are short range forces. They gotta be really, really close for them to be noticed, right? So if I got two molecules in the gas phase moving, right? If they're too far apart, they may not even recognize that they're attracted to each other, right? So uh, when we did gas laws, uh, the, uh, the pervert equation, PV equals NRT, the ideal gas law, we assumed that no matter how far apart they were, they didn't have any attractive or repulsive forces. That was an assumption we made to make the math easier. But the Van der Waals equation did account for that, right? There was that A, those A and B factors. If you remember, you have to go back and look at it. So if we account for those intermolecular forces, it changes the, the gas law equation, and you have to use the Van der Waals equation, which was not fun, as a lot of you realized. Um, so the closer they get, the more the intermolecular forces take impact. Right? So the closer I can get those together, the stronger those intermolecular forces are going to be. So that's going to be important for um, like a couple uh, like ions. The closer a uh, cation and anion can get together, the stronger that's going to be. Uh, Coulomb's law, right? We can see that mathematically uh, in Coulomb's law later when we look at solids. Um, we're going to look at molecules, especially organic ones later, based on their molecular shape. So molecular shape's going to have an impact because some molecules have shapes that allow them to get closer together versus other ones that are like bigger, they're bulkier. And it's like, uh, right? Like, you know, if I have my two arms, I could get them pretty close. But if, if they're all bent up, they can't stack real easy. Uh, so we'll look at the impact of molecular shape uh, uh, in a little bit when we look at specific types of intermolecular forces, London dispersion forces specifically. So how close can they get? The closer they can get, you keep that in mind, the stronger those intermolecular forces tend to be. Another one is temperature, which we're not going to really worry about too much uh, at this point when we're, when we're determining the types of intermolecular forces and comparing the strengths of intermolecular forces. We're going to be assuming they're all at the same temperature, okay? But when we look at a specific, say, the same species at two different temperatures, right, or more importantly later on when we look at some of the properties of uh, liquids and solids and whatnot, things like viscosity, you know, resistance to flow, surface tension, a lot of different properties, we'll go, okay, so they have these particular intermolecular force strengths. Okay, that's fine. But what happens if we heat it up? What if we're at a higher temperature or colder temperature? Does that alter that property, right? Does it make it more or less viscous, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, and so what I want you to remember is temperature, right, is atomic or molecular motion. So vibrations of bonds, rotations of molecules, right, translational motion, those kinds of things are all based on temperature. For gases, if it's warmer, if there's more thermal energy, they're moving with more kinetic energy, right? And when they hit, that's why the pressure goes up, right? But also you get more vibrations, more rotations, all those kinds of things. Don't you think when we're looking at forces of attraction, if they're rotating and moving more, 
right? The liquid phase or something like that, that's going to disrupt and make it harder for these intermolecular forces to lock in. So intermolecular forces tend to weaken as temperature increases, which then has impacts on a lot of these liquid and solid properties. Okay, so we've got these terms in. Let's do some separate videos and look at things like hydrogen bonding, London dispersion forces, etc., etc. Now, if you're a biologist, I'm going to write this uh, up on the board here. I'm going to write this. T chemistry, we don't use this term. But if you're in biology or some other uh, science like that, they tend to not use intermolecular forces as the word for that. They use the van der Waal forces. Remember I'd mentioned the van der Waals equation versus the ideal gas equation? The van der Waals equation takes into account intermolecular forces. So IM forces are commonly whoops, called van der Waal forces. But again, like I said, in chemistry, we tend to just say intermolecular forces or ion forces. But van der Waal forces is perfectly fine. Just forces of attraction between two different species, which we're going to look at lots of different types. Let's do it.